All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining our final webinar of 2014. Um, hard to believe it's already the end of the year, but that's, uh, that's where we are. So today we are doing mapping failure modes to predictive technologies. We've got Terry Harris from Reliable Process Solutions who's uh, joining us to present on this topic and we have to give him a big thanks because he's stepped away from his daughter's basketball game um, to, uh, to present this. So uh, if you hear some cheering in the background, that's uh, hopefully it's cheering for her. Um, <laughs> So um, before we get started, just a couple oops, housekeeping things. So, you know, UE Systems, we've been providing ultrasound solutions for over 40 years now, and we, we get asked all the time, you know, how does ultrasound replace infrared or vibration, or how does it complement? And, and, and the story is it, it really does, you know, it, it really is a complementary technology, and, and there's different, different uses for and, and failure modes for all the predictive technologies. So it's, this is a great topic to have Terry come and, and help us out with today so we can, um, you know, help you all understand when ultrasound is effective, when it's not, when infrared might be a better solution, and, and when you might want to pair them all up together. So um, since we get asked that a lot, we thought this would be a great way to end the year. And uh, I am recording this, so we'll put it up on our website. If you have to step out early or you've got someone who just couldn't make it, we'll, we'll make this available on our website, as we do with all of our webinars. And also, we welcome questions, so type those away um, as you think of them. We've got the little questions box um, in your little control panel. So ask, ask those questions. I'll interrupt Terry um, when it makes sense. Otherwise, we'll, we'll obviously have some Q&A time towards the end. So. With that, I will toss the screen over to Terry. So give us one second here. And uh, Terry, take it away. All right. Thank you, Maureen. And welcome, everybody, to the webinar today. Uh, I'm sitting here at Bradley University. My daughter's playing today. But um, if you hear some screaming and yelling in the background, that means the game's close, which it is. So, But welcome, everybody. And what we're going to talk about today, it's a real important topic. Uh, as I do predictive technologies trainings at different companies looking at the technologies, you know, one of the key things that I try to tell people to do is you have to figure out what failure mode you're actually trying to find to determine what predictive technology you use. And Because we'll see as we do the, go through the presentation, there's not just one technology that covers all the failures. <clears throat> the PF curve that I train off of here, if you can see on the right side of this curve, you can see down here on the bottom of the PF curve, uh, the reactive area of the curve, where we go out and we find failures with our human senses. We find bearings that are hot. We find things that are making noises. Uh, you know, we 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 feel things. So those are those are things we find in the reactive area using our human senses. So if you're finding your failures in this area using human senses, you're only going to be about 10 or 15 percent efficient in maintenance or in, in maintenance effectiveness. But if you get up to the, the middle part of the curve here, this is the part of the curve where we can find failures that you can't detect with human senses. And you can see we have some predictive technologies up here, which we'll briefly talk about. Mechanical ultrasound, vibration analysis, oil analysis, wear particle testing, thermography, motor circuit evaluation, non-destructive testing. If we're using these technologies correctly, understanding what we're trying to find, you can become 30 to 50 percent effective in your maintenance group. But the key is, it's reacting to what the data is telling you. I have so many of my uh, clients that are using predictive technologies, you know the data is there, it's in a three ring binder, or it's in some kind of a folder, you have to look at it, you have to find, try to determine what the data is telling you, and if you, if you actually react to it, you can become 30 to 50 percent effective or efficient maintenance. And then of course on the left side of the curve is all the proactive things you have to do, the things you do while your equipment's in its, in its peak running performance. So let, let's get on and talk about some of the predictive technologies, we're going to cover these briefly, but again, when, you, when we're mapping our technologies to our our, our failures, uh, think about what these things are trying to tell you. And, and at the end, I'll show you just a, 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 what a primitive mapping document that I use a lot of times, but there's some other ways to do it, such as processes like RCM. But again, our predictive technologies we'll cover today, you know, oil analysis, wear particle analysis, vibration analysis, thermography, mechanical ultrasound, and motor circuit evaluation. And again, as you saw them on the chart, there's no order uh, of which one is more important, it all depends on the failure mode we're trying to find. So why, why do we use predictive technologies? Well, you know, some few things here we'll talk about. Re reducing collateral damage, you know, finding that bearing in the gearbox that may be failing, 
correcting that issue before the bearing gets too bad, and then well, now we damage the gears. You know, if we can plan our work, you know, the work that comes in from predictive technologies, we're finding things months before they fail, we should be able to plan the work and have the correct spare parts there. So you know, this should reduce your expediting cost. It gives us time to do precision maintenance because we're not just running out there and fighting fires and making repairs. We can actually do precision work. Now, the company I came from, Cargill, you know, one of our goals was reducing spare parts. So our goal in the company, we said if we could predict that failure a month before it failed, we would not stop the spare part. So we were able to, over the course of five years, reduce 30% of our spare parts inventory. And again, more efficient use of maintenance time, less repair, emergency downtime. Your repair work actually extends equipment life, and it should create safer work conditions because now the work is planned. But again, which technology, which is the technology needed for the failure mode that could occur? Well, you know, there's some processes that help us look at this. RCM is a process, Reliability Centered Maintenance. And we'll, we'll, I'll talk about a database that we have in this company and, and, a, and like even companies like Allied. You do this process, and what the process does, it looks at how each component fails, and then we, these, we can assign a task like a predictive technology that will detect that failure. And that becomes part of one of the ways we determine what technology will find the failure. You know, one of the things we'll look at at the end is list, in the equipment, list all the equipment in your plant and then make a chart that shows all the predictive technologies that are available and which ones would find failure modes in that type of equipment. And then what you have to do is select the most effective uh, predictive technology for that equipment component. You know, I get this question all the time. You know, is there a technology that will find all the failures? What is the silver bullet technology? Well, there's really not one, right? Because, like I said, we have to understand what failure mode we're actually looking for. And, you know, some examples here. Well, and again, this, the, the bottom comment on here, we must control costs when you're using predictive technologies. I remember the company I came from, we found out about predictive technologies. We went out, we started doing all the predictive technologies on everything not very cost effective, and we didn't have time to fix all the things we were finding. So we had to have a process then to determine what technologies do we really need to use and what equipment do we really need to check. So if you're looking at predictive technologies, here's a couple here. Oil analysis cannot detect coupling misalignment. So again, if we're looking for the failure mode of alignment or balance, oil analysis is not going to help us much. Vibration analysis may help us, but vibration analysis could not detect if our lubricant additives are depleted or our lubricant viscosity is changed, or there's moisture in the lubricant. So we have to use another technology. If you're using thermography, well, thermography cannot detect imbalance. And another thing about thermography, if you look at where thermography is on the failure curve, you know, the next very next thing that's going to happen is you're going to feel it with your hand, right? So thermography, in a lot of cases, except for electrical and, and some other, like, insulation failures, it's that farther down the failure curve. Now, mechanical ultrasound, you know, we're going to look at this one in a second, but it, it'll find a lot of failures early on the curve. I teach all my customers that if you're looking for bearing failures, you're going to find a bearing failure first with mechanical ultrasound over vibration because vibration has to have movement. And we're going to hear bearings with the mechanical ultrasound tool before they start moving, before they go into that vibration state. So, again, understanding what we're trying to find and then mapping those failures to our predictive technologies. So again, when we're selecting the correct predictive technology, I'm going to keep repeating this over and over, understand what specific failure mode you're trying to find. And then, here's, a, here's something I teach my customers in my predictive training. The cost of the technology cannot be more than the cost of the potential failure or the downtime. So if, you know, if your downtime is only going to cost $1,000 and you're spending you know, $12,000 a year doing, using a technology, it's probably not very cost effective. So look at the cost of failure and the cost of the technology. But again, predictive technology tools, they allow for detection and correction of de deteriorating conditions and assets before they lead to failure. So that's what we're trying to do. I've been in companies where they're using predictive technologies. They're still not reacting until they have an equipment failure. So you know, you got one or two choices there. Stop using the technology or react to the data. We want to find out when components are deteriorating long before they fail. Let's look, at what, let's look at oil analysis real quick, just a few quick slides. You know, what are we looking for there? Well, we want to know if there's moisture in our loops. You know, moisture can reduce your component life by 50, 60 percent. We want to know if the lube's oxidized. You know, is it, is, has it met the lube met its lifetime? Is it really a lubricant anymore? You know, once your lubricants turn black and dark, they're really not lubricants anymore, but people look at them and say, well, it's still oil. 
or it still feels like oil, but once it's oxidized, it's not a very good lubricant, and you have high component wear. You know, a lot of people don't know that in every drum of oil you buy, there's additives in there, different additive packages. Well, your oil analysis tells you what those additives are and how much is in there, because once they're gone, you can have increased equipment wear. Particle counts, how many particles are in the lube? You know, has the viscosity changed? Has the oil oxidized so much that the acid number's gone up and actually caused an acid erosion in your equipment? So a lot of things you can find with oil analysis. You know, again, one of the big ones there, not understanding the ISO 4406 uh, cleanliness code. How many particles and what are the size of particles in your lubricant? You know, getting rid of the particles can add three to eight times the life to your bearings and rotating equipment components. So it's really important to understand this technology. When do we do it? You know, monthly on some equipment, some equipment every three months. You know, some, most equipment you're playing, you're going to never pull an oil analysis because it's not critical enough to do that. But again, this technology, what, what can we find with it? Well, failure modes. What are we looking for with oil analysis? Well, the lubricant life reduction. Has the oil oxidized? Is the acid number going up? Is the viscosity changing? What about contamination? That's a failure mode we're trying to find in our lubricants. Moisture, particles, chemicals. What does your process have in it? I mean, do you have a lot of moisture? Are there particles? Are you close to seawater? You know, where you can where you can get contamination. And then a lot of times in with equipment wear, the oil analysis is going to tell us we have high levels of iron and tin. And once you see the iron and tin going up going up in your uh, oil analysis sample, you have bearing wear. And some most of the time it's bearing wear that you can't go back and correct. Where with some technologies like mechanical ultrasound, we can find the noise. You know, before we start seeing the high levels of iron and tin you know, other metal components that come out of your equipment. All important things, which are failure modes, we can map back to this technology. Wear particle analysis. This technology looks at the particles in our lubricants and tells them what they are. You know, are these particles from the, are, are they dirt from the pro, from your process? Are they dirt from the process next door? You know, are they, are they particles coming out of the ocean? You know, are they pieces of bearings or gears from your equipment? Very good technology to see what the particles are. Oil analysis will tell you the particle counts, how many of them are there, but this technology is going to tell you what they, what they actually are. It's called analytical forography. It's actually you'll get back pictures of the particles, and we're going to be able to see what they are. Here, here's a couple of, of, of examples here. Some the top two slides, those are metal particles lined up. In analytical forography, we can see the see the particles and what they are. In the bottom slide, we have a few particles, but this came from a from a coal fire uh, power plant where we have fly ash particles and coal particles floating around on the sample tells us what's in our loops. The particle in the lower right hand corner, we, these are actually pieces off of a bearing or a gear in a component. We can see them in there, we know we've got an issue, we know we've got a problem, now we can make decisions on how to use it. But again, we can map this technology if you have critical equipment. Sometimes you want to use analytical forography to tell you what, what kind of wear patterns you have or what kind of like in the picture in the lower right hand corner, is there fly ash in there? Where's it coming from? How do we keep it out? These are, these uh, tests are more expensive, so you have to you know do these based on your equipment, based on the criticality of your equipment. You don't want to do wear particle analysis on all of your equipment. Mechanical ultrasound. You know this technology, like we said, can find failures in rotating equipment much earlier than vibration analysis. Like we said, vibration analysis you have to have movement. It's looking for how many mils, how many thousands of inches of, that the component's actually moving during the cycle. We don't have to worry about that with mechanical ultrasound. We can hear the noise. You know, mechanical ultrasound tools, and, and most of you probably on this call are using these tools, but again, lots of failure modes that you can map back uh, that, that can be used with this technology. Again, the information you get from this technology, if you look at this, the uh, database that comes with this. You can, you can see a compressor valve here, what a good valve looks like, so we can not only get the sound, but we can actually see what the difference is. So there's a good compressor valve on the left, a bad compressor valve on the right. So by watching this, this information, this data month to month, we can make a decision on when to change that compressor valve or when to do the repairs. Very, very good technology. Again, the technology can, can be used for electrical. You know, I remember back when we first bought our electrical ultrasound tool, we opened up the 480 door of the MCC gear. We put the probe right on the breaker, right on the starter. We were finding uh, failures or potential failures long before thermography found them. We could hear noise. So many times, months before, 
we actually had temperature with thermography. We were finding failures with our tool and making those corrections. Now here in this slide, uh, we don't we don't open the doors up anymore due to safety, but we can listen around the seam of the door, and we can see we we have an issue there. We have some noise. We open the box up with the camera, and we've got a loose connection. So again, here's another failure mode that we can map back. So your electrical switch gear can be mapped back to thermography, and it can be mapped back to mechanical ultrasound. Two great technologies for electrical. You know, typical failures we can see. You know, with with vacuum leaks. Uh, pressure leaks, all kinds of equipment we can find leaks on. You know, using it for steam traps to find out if the steam trap's actually functioning correctly before the th thermographic camera tells us it's not. Electrical equipment, you know, switch gear, transformers, all things that have failure modes that can be found with mechanical ultrasound. You know, mechanical inspections. I remember the plant I came from. We checked every bearing on every motor, every pump, every fan monthly. And we found failures at a really early state. Whenever the reading got to a certain point, we would schedule that bearing for a replacement, schedule that motor for a replacement. So again, we're mapping all these failures with rotating components back to mechanical ultrasound. The different industries that are using this technology, you know, automotive, the railroad industry, the postal service, you know, on their high-speed conveyors. So again, that this is this is one of the tools where I always tell people in the training. There's more failure modes that you can trace back to with mechanical ultrasound than any other technology. So very, very good technology to, to map a lot of failures back to. You know, early, early we bought, you know, a lot of companies buy these just to find air leaks. And look at, the, look at the cost savings just with air leaks. But if air leaks is a major concern, if you're adding a compressor at your plant because you can't keep up. I was at a craft plant in Atlanta a few years ago, and they were adding a compressor. They already had three because they couldn't keep up. A mechanical ultrasound guy came in in one day, walked through a 50-foot section of the wall, and found 43 leaks in that plant. After they started correcting leaks, they ended up taking a compressor off. So now they ended up with two spares. But again, huge cost savings with air leaks. This slide here, I, you know, I picked up at a UE conference. This is a, a refinery. This is the number of leaks they found in a refinery, what it was going to cost them annually. Well, look, over a million dollars in leaks that they can control to, to pay for a $10,000 tool that they had bought at that time. So again, failure modes, you know, leaks, you know, losing your products, those are failure modes and that can be mapped back for use with mechanical ultrasound. So thermography, you know, used to find failures due to temperature change. You know, anytime we have increase in temperature with our electrical equipment, our mechanical equipment, the chance of failure increases. So again, a good technology. But again, when we got temperature, we're farther down the failure curve. Some of these things should have been found with other technologies earlier. But again, a good technology to map back to failures. I threw this slide in here. This is misunderstood at a lot of plants I go to when we talk about thermography. If you just look at the copper number, this is the emissivity reading. And if you don't understand this reading and set this correctly in your cam camera, the temperature that you're reading on the camera is not correct. And a key one there is when you put brand new switch gear in, where the switch gear is polished, the copper is shiny. Look at the difference in emissivity between polished copper and oxidized copper. And this is going to this is going to change your temperature sometimes 30 to 40 percent if that emissivity number is off that much. So good things to understand. Cameras, a lot of good cameras out there. They're getting cheaper all the time. I can remember back in the mid 90s, pricing the first thermographic camera at Cargill, $65,000. These two cameras here are down around the six and eight thousand dollar range. What can we find electrically? Look at look at the slide on the right. You can't see anything with the with the human eye, but with the camera, we see we have hot connections. Again, what's what's the failure mode here? We're trying to find hot connections. We map this back to our thermography. Here, mechanically, we're looking at the, we look at this motor and bearing walking through a plant. We don't see anything, but easily with the camera, we see we've got a temperature rise. Not a lot, not a big temperature rise, but easy to find that we have an issue here. So if we monitor this month to month, understand what that temperature is, and this may be telling us we need to add some lubricant to the to the component. But again, these are failures we can map back as as using thermography as a tool to find these mechanical failures. Here's a motor here. This this motor was at a textile plant. And you can see on the far left-hand side of the motor, there's just a little bit of cooling air coming through the cooling fan, and the motor's hot. We went to the back of this cooling fan and cleaned all the textile fiber off the back of the fan guard, and the, the, the temperature of this motor dropped down 35 degrees. 
Now, 35 degrees in electrical motors, if you look at the, the life factor for your insulation and your electric motors, for every 18 degree rise, you cut the insulation life in half. So again, cleaning the back of this fan guard over, we more than double the life of the insulation on the, on the windings of that motor. Steam traps, big energy waster. You know, is, your, is, is what you're looking for, is your failure mode uh, lost steam or lost condensate? You know, inefficient steam traps working. Well, this can, you can see with our technology here, we can map steam traps back to thermography. Now again, like I said, with mechanical ultrasound, we could have listened to this trap and maybe known a lot earlier that the trap was actually leaking by and malfunctioning before it got to the point where it's blowing steam straight through. A couple pictures here. This is a this is a evaporation tower at a refinery, with just with a camera easily finding that the insulation is not in very good shape on this column. This actual substation was taken at a plant outside of Montreal, an Alcoa aluminum foundry. Look look at all the loose connections or all the hot spots in the in the uh, substation. You know, these these are the kind of pictures we want to look at. We want to try to uh, find what the failure mode is. And again, I was, I was the guy that I was with in Canada during that time, uh, one of UE's representatives, we also had a substation like this. We found failures in the substation. We found some corona or some arcing or tracking in there with the ultrasound tool, and then we brought thermography right back in behind them to locate some of those things to see what the intensity was. But again, our first find was with, with, the, UE, with the UE tool. So what are we looking for with thermography? Changes in temperature from the last report. You know, has the, is the bearing hotter, is the motor hotter from the last time we checked it? You know, setting alarm set points. You know, what is the temperature of that equipment supposed to be and when is it in its failure mode? You know, is it a 20 degree rise or a 30 degree rise? And then mapping that back to the technology, which in this case was going to be mechanical ultrasound. You know, remember some failures found with this technology are far down the failure curve. I want to repeat that. Thermography, if we let it get to temperature, we're far down the failure curve and sometimes we can't get it back. Vibration analysis, you know, all the equipment in your plant has a natural frequency. So understanding what that frequency is and setting a baseline, and a, an example of that is, is going into a plant, you put a new pump or a new motor on, or you're building a new plant, you know, run that equipment for a day or two and then go around and get those baselines. Those baselines of that equipment should is, is about as good as that equipment will ever be. So get those baselines developed to help recognize is when you're going to have a fair. Now you check it a month from now or two months from now. As it drifts away from baseline, we know we have an issue, and then we can go back and sometimes make corrections. You know, example would be misalignment. Coupling misalignment can be found very early. Balance can be found. Imbalance can be found, and, and corrections can be made before we take out the bearings or the couplings. So all these natural vibrations, we have to know what they are. What is the natural frequency of your equipment? If you take the pump in the upper left-hand corner, if that, that pump there has five impellers on the, on the, vein, on the impeller uh, veins or on the impeller itself, so with vibration, we're, we're going to see a spike at five times on the vibration reading, which will tell us that that's, that's the natural frequency of that pump. If, the fan, if you have fan down below there, it has six blades. We're going to get a spike at six times RPM, and it's going to tell us we have six, six blades in there. We can monitor that and, and watch for these conditions. So what can vibrations tell us? You know, if, it, if it's one times RPM, we usually have imbalance. If we have misalignment, it's normally going to be at two times RPM. If we have loose bolts, or if it's three times RPM, we have loose bolts, we have a cracked base, it could be possible resonance, but understanding what things are, what, what vibration is telling us is going to help us find failures at an early mode, so, or an early stage. So some of these failures, again, we have to understand what we're looking for. If we're looking for imbalance, vibration is going to be the tool, but also mechanical ultrasound can be used for, those, for some of those uh, failures also. You know, what are the kinds of things we find with vibration analysis? You know, belt wear, crack gears, cavitation. You know, you can see bent shafts. You can see resonance on here where we have equipment that's running away from the equipment you're checking, but we're getting natural frequencies from other equipment. But again, a lot of things we can find with this. If these are your failure modes you're trying to find, vibration analysis, will be, you'd map your failure modes back to vibration analysis type data. But look at the impact of vibration on the reduction of bearing life. If we reduce vibration in a bearing by 10%, look what it does to increase life of ball bearings. 37% increase, a 42% increase in rolling uh, element bearings. 
drop down the page or drop down the left hand column to 25 percent. We reduce vibration in equipment 25 percent. Look what it does to ball bearing life, 137 percent increase. Look what it does to roller bearing life, 161 percent increase. So again, the importance of understanding the failure mode of vibration, mapping that back to the technology of vibration uh, monitoring as a predictive tool, we can find these failure modes and correct them. So when do we use you know, all of our uh, predictive technologies? You know, which, how do we decide what equipment to use them on? Well, I just put some pointers in here on this that I use in my training courses. Machineries that require expensive, lengthy, or difficult repairs have broken. Machines that are critical to production or general plan operations. Machines that are known to have to frequently suffer damage. Machines that are being evaluated for their reliability. You know, determining what, what is the reliability. And a lot of times I go into plants with just a mechanical ultrasound tool and I, I go around plants that people are buying and they say, can go around and just give me an asset health. You know, tell me when some of these things are going to fail. Well, with, with a vibration tool, you know, I can't tell you within a week. But there's a lot of times I can tell you that a, that a motor's going to fail within a month or two, or a gearbox or a pump's going to fail within a month just by using that one technology. So I, there's a, many times I go in and give a plan an asset help when they're getting ready to purchase or getting ready to, to make some, a major shutdown. And then what about machines or equipment that affect human or environmental safety? All good reasons to use predictive technologies. Another technology that's come a long way in the last five years, motor circuit evaluation or motor circuit testing, motor circuit analysis, a lot of different terms for it. You know, the, the unit on the right is from PDMA in, in Florida. The unit on the right is, is a company called Altest Pro. You know, both good tools to find failures of electric motors. But what kind of failures are we looking for? You know, power quality, power circuit, your insulation, failures in the stator or the rotor. You know, is the air gap actually there? A lot of different failures here that we can find using this technology. You can check motors offline. You know, one of the big studies that Cargill had originally back in the, in the early 2000s was checking all the spare motors that we had at plants, finding out what the, what the failure modes were, finding out how we could, uh, you know, what motors in, that we had in storage, if we put them on, how long they would last. A lot of times the, the guy told us those wouldn't last a year if you put them on because there's failures already inherent in the spare motors. And then you can do the online testing where you're checking your motors while they're actually operating the plant. But again, this is a little dangerous because you have to open up the switch gear, put, up, put your leads on there. But again, we're finding failures in our electric motors and our wiring systems while the equipment's running. So again, a good technology to find motor failures. Here's a chart here that shows a broken rotor bar. And you can see that the chart on the top shows a broken rotor bar, a couple rotations in, in the bottom uh, chart there is what a uh, good motor should look like. So again, we can find uh, broken rotor bars with mechanical ultrasound. We can find them with vibration analysis. But probably the better tool for finding these and other electrical uh, motor failures is, is mechanical, or excuse me, motor circuit evaluation. And I just threw some slides in here of all the different things you can find with this technology. Great technology to use. Again, there's a couple pages of these things. This, this, is, this is one here when you're doing your online test. We can find other failures in our system depending on where you hook your terminals up. You know, corroded terminals, loose cables, corroded fuse clips, corroded contacts. A lot of different failures you can find in a, in a panel with this tool uh, by understanding how to use it and determining what the failure mode is you're looking for. Now you have your stationary equipment, your non-destructive testing. You know, all the different methods here, visual, liquid dye penetrate, magnetic particle, ultrasonic testing, eddy current, radiography, a lot of different technologies here to find failures in our stationary equipment. You know, all the different tools we have here to find cracks in vessels. We find welds that are corroded, tanks that are corroded. We find defective welds or welds that don't have good penetration. You know, I was at a plant just a few weeks ago. It was an aluminum recycler, and, they, and all the big 17-ton uh, uh, ore pots they were moving around, they put liquid dye penetrant on all those eyes on those pots, you know, every month looking for cracks because, you know, you don't want to drop a 17-ton vat of molten aluminum. You know, people can get injured, killed, lots of equipment damaged, so they check these every month with just liquid dye penetrant. Now, again, getting toward the end of this, here, here's a, an example of a mapping document where you, have, and it's just a rudimentary one, but you can see we list the equipment types down the left-hand side. 
you know, what are all the technologies we can use for electric motors to find failures? We've got mechanical ultrasound. We can use vibration analysis. We've got thermography. You know, if I would have carried this out, you'd have motor circuit evaluation. You have bearings on here. There's three technologies that are probably good for bearings. Your electrical switch gear, you know, mechanical ultrasound. You know, at the plant I came from, we went out and with a mechanical ultrasound tool, UE9000 at that time, we had six spots on every transformer, and we took readings on those transformers every month looking for issues, looking for changes in the sound of the transformer in a specific load. And then you have thermography we can use. You know, if it's an oil transformer, we could use oil analysis. You know, your pumps. Oh, here we got transformers down lower here. But again, what we have to do at your plant is list all your equipment. And this here, I just listed the general equipment, but you can actually list all the equipment at your plant by equipment number. Make a chart like this, list all the technologies that are potentially could be used to find failures. But the key thing is determine what is the most predominant failure that you can have on that equipment. What's the predominant failure mode? And select the correct technology. Map the technology to the failure mode. And then again, you're, what you're doing there is you're mapping the technology to your equipment. So again, with only 30 or 40 minutes, this is the easiest way to explain how we map technologies to failure modes. But again, it's key. Rather than, let's say we're going to do, let's just call in the vibration guy, give him 10 or 20 pieces of equipment to check because we think it's critical or because of some other reason, you know, think, think about what technology you're going to use. Is, is vibration analysis the only technology you're using? I go to plants all the time, and that's what we're doing. We're doing one technology. Well, you can see here from the different failure modes we just talked about, there's a lot of failure modes, and there's not a single plant I've been in the U.S. where there's one technology that's going to find everything. We have to use multiple technologies, use them effectively, you know, understand the failure mode and understand the cost of failure. So that gets into another topic, you know, when we talk about asset criticality. You know, what are the top 20, 10 or 20 percent of your critical assets? You know, I saw a little uh, asset criticality database for $350. It's on sale this month for $300. I'll throw that little sales pitch in there. But it's a tool where you take all the equipment in your plant, you ask a series of questions related to safety, related to environmental, quality, uh, operations and maintenance, and you get a criticality number. And you do that for your whole plant, and you determine what the top 10% of your critical assets are. Now, the company I came from, we only did predictive technologies starting off on the first 10%, the top 10% of our critical equipment. And then as we got those issues correct, we dropped down to the top 20%. There's companies I know that only do the top 25% of the critical equipment with predictive technologies. There's other companies that do 50%, but Again, a decision you have to make in your own company. You know, determine the major failure modes for each of these equipment types. Again, I do a class called the uh, uh, failure modes of equipment class, and it goes over things like the 50 failure modes of an electric motor, you know, the 30 failure modes of a rolling, rolling element bearing. And by understanding how components fail, we can find ways to predict, prevent, and eliminate the failure modes. So now that we know some of those things in the top two, we, correct, we select the correct predictive tool for the specific failure mode. You know, we RCM, I talked about that early. You know, I have a version of RCM where you can quickly go through and do an RCM analysis and get your group together, find out what the failure modes are, and then the task at the end, we're always going to ask, can we predict, prevent, or eliminate that failure? How are we going to do that? What technology are we going to use? What preventive maintenance task are we going to use? A very, very effective tool for developing that complete maintenance strategy. Determine if the failure will cost more than the, or determine if the, if, I think I termed this or wrote this wrong in here, but determine if the failure will cost more than the cost of the technology. Uh, that, that's one thing you have to do. Don't, don't spend money uh, unwisely when you're doing predictive technologies. Make sure the technicians are trained in the technology. That's another thing. I go into plants all the time. I was at a plant where the electric motor shop had a vibration tool. They were doing all the vibration analysis at the plant. 80% of the recommendations was rebuild or replace the motor. So I got them switched off to an actual vibration technology company. And now they're actually getting real data that actually tells them what the problem is. And of course, make sure your technician, when he comes in, no matter who that technician is, and no matter what technology, you should still know what failure mode you're trying to find. They shouldn't be going out there and just randomly checking things and coming back in and telling you. Tell them what failure mode you're looking for. How can that equipment component actually fail? And then the key, I put it in red here, react to the data. 
If you don't have time to look at your predictive technology information and react to it, then you shouldn't be doing it. Just keep doing reactive maintenance because it's, there's no payback in taking readings, spending money, and not reacting. So again, that's that's the end of the webinar today. For anybody that's on the webinar today, you know we've got our, our top of the line R, RCM database is available on the website. It's on sale this month. This month, but the people on the website today can actually buy that database for twenty two hundred dollars. The closest one to it that's of that quality cost you will cost you twenty thousand dollars. So again, thanks for your time today. If you have any questions, you got my email here. You can email me. If you want a PDF copy of the presentation, just, just shoot me an email or let Maureen know. They'll have the copy also. Okay. Well, thanks, Terry. Do you have time to take just a couple of the questions that have come in um, sure. online here? Sure. All right. Great. Um, so one question was um, if you've got a failure mode where there's multiple technologies that, that you can use, how do you decide which one? So for instance, you know, on, on bearings, you might be able to use vibration and ultrasound. So how do you make that decision? Well, and, and that's one of the tougher decisions at a plant. But again, both those technologies are good at finding failures. Like I say, I find more failures in, the, in an earlier stage with mechanical ultrasound uh, than I do with vibration. But a lot of times I'll find fires with mechanical ultrasound and have to bring vibration back in behind it to get a specific reason. But again, both those technologies are good technologies for bearings. All right. Um, here's one that just came in. What failure trends have you seen increasing or dis decreasing as you transition from time-based to PDM at, at the facilities that you've been have ac had had access to, I guess, is the right way to say that. Yeah. Well, when, when you're when you're doing time based, you're you're finding failure, you're, and I, I'm assuming he's doing time based with human senses. But doing time based, you're, you know, you're, a lot of times you don't get to them enough. When you start doing predictive technologies and you start looking at the trends, you know, we can actually see things with the tools that we can't see with just doing time based inspections because because it's more detailed. You know, if you're if you're doing human senses inspection and doing time based inspection. The component's already in its the lower part of that failure curve, and it's still going to fail. We can find things with our predictive tools before they get to that point and make corrections. All right. And um, do you have any comments on over lubrication as a failure mode? Oh yeah, yeah. And, and that's if you if if you we didn't, and of course you guys will probably do that webinar this year, the 50 failure modes of lubrication. But over lubrication is a key one. And uh, you know, a lot of my training courses with predictive technology, using the grease caddy or using an ultrasound tool to find out how much grease the component actually needs, but not only find it how how much is what the freak what is the frequency. And if you take the stupidity of me when I was younger running maintenance, you know, I used to grease a four inch bearing and I give it four shots a week. Well, with the with the ultrasound tool, we found out that bearing needed one and a half shots every week, or it needed it needed one and a half shots a week, or it needed a half a shot every other day. So by knowing that, we put automatic lubers on, or we changed our PM test to make sure the correct amount of lube was in there, and and right away our, our components started lasting three to four times longer. Nice. Um, okay, another one. Given that transformers have a long life cycle, at what point would you even bother doing any testing on them? Well, and, and, and that's what you have to look at. Like a, like a new transformer, you may take some initial readings and, and, and maybe check them every six months or a year. But as transformers reach their 15 to 20 year life cycle, we switch them over to once a month. Okay. But again, that's a decision that's got to be made. Yeah, because the, the failure modes of new transformers, I mean, you know, there's not much happens in the first 10 years, but then after that, you can start picking up failures. Okay. Um, let's see. When performing vibration and or mechanical ultrasound, do you need to record readings and compare them as the PDM goes on? Oh yes, I, I, you always want to record and compare because that, that's what we're looking for is trends, and and a lot of times, and, and you know some of the things that we used to trend and study at Cargill using vibration analysis and using mechanical ultrasound, that's how we found the data that we're finding things earlier with vibration analysis, and then we start tracking more, you doing more some vibration analysis, you know, to figure out what those exact failures might be like inside of a gearbox, which tooth is it, or which gear is it, or which bearing. Sometimes you can't find that out with ultrasound, but we know the failures there a lot at a real early stage. All right, and here's probably the million-dollar question: um, How do we get our coworkers to buy into this kind of a program? 
Well, I think we have to have myself or Doug Wage and train them. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, takes tra it takes training. You know, trying to build a reliability process from the bottom up usually doesn't work. We have to get everybody trained and everybody understanding what, what this process can actually do for a plant or a facility. All right. And probably the million and one dollar question, is your daughter's basketball team winning? Well, I can't see the score from oh, here. No. They were only down by one, but I see there's a lot of uh, Bradley fans cheering, so I think we're down a little bit. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> well, we uh, we better let you get back to, to cheering her on. I'm just going to take the screen back here so I can uh, okay. do a couple closing uh remarks but Terry thank you so much and thanks for that uh, offer um, for for your RCM database so we'll uh, hopefully some folks will take advantage of that and uh, and definitely hit you up with any questions that they might have um, so again we thank you for for coming on today and and giving us all this information um, We've got, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that we are recording this, so we'll put the recording of this up on our website, uesystems.com. It's in the webinar section. Um, we've got every webinar we've ever done is up there, including others that Terry's done, um, some on lubrication. Um, he actually did a failure modes, or not a failure modes, an equipment criticality webinar for us. So there's just tons of information up on our website, including, you know, different uh, the different applications that ultrasound is, is best for. So take a look there, and if, if there's something you can't find, just let us know. Um, definitely stay connected with us. Uh, we've got our LinkedIn groups. We're on Twitter. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure we kind of keep these conversations going. There were some, definitely some, maybe not questions that people were typing in, but more kind of comments. So that's a great place um, to take sort of those comments to get feedback on um, so you can hear from your peers what, what other folks are having issues with or, or maybe experiencing the same, the same kinds of pain points. So um, definitely find us there on LinkedIn. And um, just a couple dates. So our next webinar will be on January 22nd, and it's a pretty fitting topic for uh, the start of the new year. Uh, Sean Eisenhower with Iridicio is going to be talking about seven reliability resolutions you can't start your year without. So uh, as we all start thinking about uh, our plans for the new year and, and the things we want to accomplish, it sounds like that's going to be a great great one to help us get started. And then we've got our, our conferences, Reliable Asset World and Ultrasound World 11, uh, June 2nd through the 5th in Clearwater, Florida. Um, Terry's actually going to be doing a workshop for us there on um, equipment criticality. So I know that comes up almost on every webinar we do, no matter what the topic um, is kind of the the value of, of making sure you know exactly which equipment to be even you know worrying about with with your different predictive technologies and things like that so um, make plans to join us there we'd love to have you all um, and with that I'll leave our contact info up I hope everybody that's been on here today has a wonderful holiday and a great uh, start to 2015 and uh, if we don't hear from you before then we'll definitely look forward to speaking with you all and, and learning with you all again in the new year so Thanks again, Terry, and everybody have a great day.